cholera is the name of that disease in common talk. It is lowercase. Unless we're saying at the beginning of a sentence, cholera killed 30 people today, and it'll probably kill 300 people in over the next week, because that's how cholera happens. We'll talk about that in a second. But cholera is lowercase because it's the specific name. You can abbreviate in many cases, and when you can abbreviate, I suggest you do. But know when you can and cannot abbreviate. If the generic name is just initials, like HIV, you can abbreviate. Like AIDS, you can abbreviate. AIDS, HIV, which by the way, AIDS is the, sta the latest stage of it, is the late stage of HIV. The epithet is just initials. You can capitalize both those initials. Tuberculosis is the common epithet of mycobacterium tuberculosis. But the common epithet is tuberculosis, and TB, in both capital letters, is the common epithet. The genus can be just the first initial, but you spell out the species, like V. cholerae, or M. tuberculosis, or P. ovale, or P. vivax, or P. falciparum. When you write causative agent or pathogen, they are interval interchangeable terms when you are talking in the context of an infectious disease. Only in the context of an infectious disease. For the purposes of malaria only, parasite is also interchangeable. Causative agent, pathogen, and parasite are interchangeable for malaria only. For cholera, for HIV, for tuberculosis, you can only interchange causative agent and pathogen. For measles, for smallpox, only malaria you can use parasite interchangeably. None of the others are caused by parasites or protoctist. When you type a species name, you can italicize. Because this is not a test where you type anything, there is no typing. There is no italics. So you are handwriting this test. You underline. If you are to italicize it, if it's the Latin species name, like Vibrio cholerae, you underline Vibrio cholerae. Don't do that thing where you pick up the paper, and while you're writing, you turn it to the side to write on the sideways to get the angle of the page. Because that constitutes a different handwriting. And if you have a different handwriting from one sentence to the next, that is a malpractice. You are not going to have your exam scored. They will fail you simply because you have more than one handwriting. Underline instead of italicizing. When you mean to make italics, underline instead. Understand? Underline. Do not fail the exam because you wanted to make it look pretty by turning your page to the side so you could get that nice, crisp, angular writing. And if you write in cursive, only write in cursive. If you write in block lettering, only write in block lettering. Do not switch between cursive and block lettering. If you switch between, you are using two different handwritings, your, your, your paper will fail. You will fail your paper because you have two different handwritings, two different people must have written that test. Only one handwriting. If your handwriting is inconsistent, because sometimes you are more angular with your cursive than you are otherwise, sometimes it's straight up, sometimes it's angular, like when you get really stressed it gets angular, start writing in block lettering. Make sure that it is very consistent handwriting. Do not fail this exam because 
you got stressed out and you started writing too fast and your handwriting changed. Do not fail because your handwriting changed. That would be the ultimate sadness. The tears that you will shed. Tears beyond measure. Tears that will fill bathtubs. All right. So, these are Latin species and genus names. If you intend to use the Latin species and genus names, memorize the spelling, because spelling counts. If you're going to spell malaria, spell it correctly. If you're going to spell plasmodium, spell it correctly. If you're going to spell human immunodeficiency virus instead of writing HIV, spell immunodeficiency correctly. Spelling counts. You must memorize the correct spelling. Incorrect spelling will not garner you points. You will lose points. Even if everything else is correct, if it is spelled wrong, you can lose that point. Correct spelling. All right. I'd like to formally introduce some terms. The transmission cycle is the means by which the pathogen is passed from one host to another. The cycle can often include animal intermediate hosts. Vaccination, a preparation of pathogenic material, live, weakened, or killed, that serves to prime the host immune system and grant immunity to pathogens before infection can occur. We will discuss vaccination in greater detail later. Vector, the means by which the disease is spread may include animal intermediates, airborne, fomites, contact with body fluid, or others. Silent carrier, or just carrier, an asymptomatic infected individual often capable of transmitting the disease. Epidemic, or rather, let's discuss endemic first before I get to epidemic. Sorry, I went out of order. When a disease is always present in a population, it is said to be endemic. Epidemic, a sudden increase in the number of cases in a short period of time. A pandemic is a sudden increase in the number of cases across a continent or the entire world. So a pandemic is an epidemic over a greater area. An epidemic could be local. A pandemic is international or national or global. Prevalence. The number of people who have the disease at any given time. I would also like to discuss incidence. Um, incidence is the number of new cases. Incidence. And we already know morbidity. And mortality. Incidence is the number of new cases. Morbidity is the illnesses associated with it, the disease burden. Mortality is the number of deaths. The word annual means every year. I'd also like to introduce the term incubation. Incubation period. Incubation. I-N-C-U-B-A-T-I-O-N. An incubation period is how long after exposure to a pathogen does it take for symptoms to develop.
So we begin our, our foray into infectious diseases with cholera. Cholera results from the infection by the bacteria Vibrio cholerae. Notice, by the way, I capitalized cholera here because it's beginning a sentence-ish. It's a title. But Vibrio cholera, capital V, lowercase c. It's the, it's the name. It is a bacterial illness. That is the type of organism that it is. It is, a, or it is a bacterial organism. The pathogen is a bacteria. Up to 75% of infected individuals have no symptoms at all. They are silent carriers of cholera. The real cholera does not cause them illness. The bacterium is passed through the fecal-oral route. It's passed through fecal material, i.e. feces. Um, and I don't know how strict they are on the spelling of feces, but um, the UK spelling of feces is F-A-E-C-E-S. The, the American spelling is F-E-C-E-S. Uh, so just add an A if you're feeling up to it, but make sure that your spelling is consistent unlike the poop in cholera. All right, so in large numbers, it is passed through the feces. Oh, you should mention that if you, you start using British spelling, you need to be consistent with that too, because if you... Oh, shit. If you interchange between British spelling and American spelling, they could also not for malpractice. Fair enough. If you're going to be American, be American. If you're going to be British, be British. Start saying boot and torch. Just maybe stick to the, all the American spellings then. Because it's easier on all of us. So, I mean, I've been showing you all the British spellings just in case. Stick to American. Or only stick to British. Your choice. But stick to one, not both. Fair enough. All right. That part I didn't know. All right, so it's passed through feces in large numbers, and it lives in water and contaminated food and can thrive in places with poor sanitation. So brackish water, salt water, uh, places with uh, poor sanitation. It's on the, if you put it, if somebody who is preparing the food doesn't wash their hands after wiping, even if they're silent carriers, and then they're preparing food, it's on the food now. And then a person eats the food. They now have cholera. So, in places with poor sanitation, there's an unclean water supply where sewage mixes with the water. If infected persons are allowed to handle food without washing their hands, that's the unclean, poor sanitation. But, there's another way to get cholera without poor sanitation. Shellfish, specifically oysters and mussels, that grow in brackish water. You can find Vibrio cholerae in brackish water. In fact, this is the most common way that outbreaks occur in the post-sanitation movement world. The filter feeders that are oysters and mussels, they filter out the water and they collect the Vibrio cholera in larger quantities in them. And then you go and you eat the oysters and the mussels, and now you have bacteria in your intestinal system. And you, will, you may or may not develop symptoms. So the most recent outbreak um, that was significant. I believe it was called El Tor strain of cholera. I don't remember what it was. I believe it was the 60s. Um, I think 40,000 people got infected. I don't recall. It is, in fact, in the textbook. Um, I checked after I talked to you about it. But 
Let's talk about after a person is exposed. After a person is exposed to contaminated food or water, the bacterium will enter the, ga the gastrointestinal system. Stomach acid is the first barrier of defense. Stomach acid will kill Vibrio cholera. However, if it is present in sufficient numbers that not all of them die in the stomach acid, if enough of them survive, they will set up shop inside of the intestine, the small intestine. And they may or may not start producing cholera gen. Cholera gen is a toxin produced by cholera that is what is producing the symptoms of cholera. It's not the bacteria itself. The bacteria, 75% of the time, do nothing. They don't harm you. It's the toxin. So what does the toxin do? The toxin stimulates the release of electrolytes from your gut cell epithelium into the gut lumen. And what does water do? It follows those electrolytes because electrolytes are salts. Water follows salt. Water follows salt fast and in high quantities. So this process of producing collagen, Cambridge says two hours to five days before they'll start producing toxin. Okay. So let's talk about this poop now. The water following the salt, it makes this a very watery diarrhea. And it's referred to as rice water stool. Rice water stool because it looks like you boiled brown rice overcooked for a long time and you just got that starch stuff and you just drained off the water. And sometimes there's these little flecks of mucus floating in it that looks like little free grains of rice. And there's basically mostly colorless, maybe a little yellow, cloudy, watery diarrhea. So somewhere along the way, when you are producing this rice water stool, you'll be pooping because, let's face it, you're going to be pooping constantly. You'll be producing something like up to 20 liters of, up to 20 liters of diarrhea a day. That is a high number. That's like one of the high levels of the amount of liquid diarrhea that you will be pushing out. So, what's going to happen to me? I don't think that I can drink. Five and a half of these every day. Full. I don't think I can possibly put that much water into my mouth, let alone swallow it. Well, good news is you are not going to have to put that much of that in your mouth if you have the right fluids. So if you don't have the right fluids, you'll die within 24 hours. Um, without proper oral rehydration, patients die in 24 hours. Um, but proper oral rehydration limits the effects of the diarrhea because proper oral rehydration is an electrolyte fluid mixture. It's an electrolyte water mixture with sugar, with glucose. And the, the electrolytes are present so that you are going to absorb those electrolytes and the glucose is present so that you absorb those electrolytes through active transport because electrolytes cannot cross a membrane, a nonpolar hydrophobic tails, the, hydropo the nonpolar hydrophobic tails of the plasma membrane without the aid 
of active transport. The glucose is to provide the fuel for mitochondria to produce ATP to fuel active transport of electrolytes across a membrane. Electrolytes, by the way, are ions like sodium and potassium. Now, you must, uh, once you have those electrolytes crossing back into the gut cells, the water will follow that salt back in. So you have less diarrhea. You actually reduce the amount of diarrhea by this oral rehydration fluid. Rehydrating with the correct fluids will actually reduce the severity of the diarrhea, the quantities. But you do need to keep careful track of your ins and outs. Your outs is how much are you pooping and how much are you peeing. That's right, you, have to, you forgot about peeing, didn't you? You have to also keep track of how much fluid you are losing through urine. So urine and diarrhea, the quantity of volume, the volume of diarrhea and urine being produced must be reabsorbed through oral rehydration solution. So, you need a combination of water, electrolytes, and sugar. Basically, you need not a sponsor. I, er, I, I, incur, I basically am telling you, not a sponsor. They are not a sponsor. And Gatorade works too. That's fine. They're a competitor. They're made by different companies. All right. So, where is the cholera? Wherever there is poop in the water, bad things are generally bound to happen. It's just a matter of time. So we've done a pretty good job in the last century or so of keeping cholera under wraps, except in parts of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. There you'll end up with three to five million new cases a year, an incidence of three to five million, and 100 to 120,000 deaths per annum, annually, annual mortality, 100 to 120,000. So this is a map of cholera reported outbreaks, just reported outbreaks in 2010 to 2014. The yellow is 2010 to 2013. The red is 2014 only. 2014 doesn't mean that there weren't also in 2010 to 2013. So these are areas with cholera. There's Latin America, Africa, India is, South, is the Asian subcontinent, and there's Southeast Asia, and China, little parts of China. So this is the rice water stool you've heard so much about. And this is a microscopic, a microscopic uh, picture, a micrograph of Vibrio cholera under the microscope. It is a bacilli bacterium. It also has a flagella, so it is mobile. It can swim, and it does swim. So the diagnosis, by the way, of cholera is made by taking a stool sample and putting it under a microscope doing a wet mount, and there's no problem with the wet part, because that's what the stool is, rice water. So it would be a simple solution to eradicate cholera. All you need to do is give everyone plumbing, clean water for them and their livestock and all of their crops. Unfortunately, that's very expensive. So the use of contaminated wastewater for the growing of vegetables and the washing and bathing is very commonplace. And the money and resources don't always go to providing oral rehydration therapy. They should if they're not going to pay for plumbing. But unfortunately, uh, resources, there is a scarcity of resources in many places. So now let's talk about measles. Measles is also known as rubiola, but for Cambridge purposes, you call it measles. You call it measles all day. 
Um, measles is the result of an infection by Morbilli virus, measles virus. Measles virus is the species name, Morbilli virus is the genus. It is in the family, which is a taxonomic step above genus, Paramyxaviridae, which translates from Greek to slime beyond slime. So you can tell what kind of disease that is. Um, which includes measles, mumps, and several other upper respiratory infections. This is actually one of the most infectious diseases known to man. Essentially, the viral particles, the pathogen itself, comes out of an infected, visuals, infected, visual, an infected individual's saliva and mucus and spreads through contact with this, fluid, with this fluid. And it can also be spread into the air around the person in a droplet. And it hangs in the air after a sneeze for up to two hours. So any heavy droplets, by the way, that fall are also still infectious to the touch. So essentially you have to wait two hours after someone with measles leaves, then you can go in and Lysol the heck out of the entire room and hope that you killed it. Except it's a virus, so it's not really alive in the first place. So hope that you destroyed it. Oops. So the diagnosis of measles, or rather, not the diagnosis, but more stuff about measles, the symptoms of measles. There is no animal or environmental vector or reservoir for measles. And by the way, a reservoir is a place where it just hangs out. A place where pathogens just sort of hang out. So brackish water for cholera would be a reservoir for cholera. Uh, right. So there is no environmental vector or reservoir for measles. Only human hosts can spread measles. But Measles is contagious for up to one to two days before the onset of any symptoms and until four days after the final stage of symptoms appear. So we are talking about a long window of infectivity. On average, a person will infect somewhere between 12 and 18 people. Someone infected with measles will infect somewhere between 12 and 18 people before they have cleared it. So a non-immune individual who is exposed to someone in a, in a very, um, sorry, in the very lengthy contagious window of measles has a 90% chance of contracting measles. So if you are susceptible and you are exposed to someone with measles, there is a 90% chance that you will catch measles. That you will be, that the measles will be transmitted to you. So after exposure, there is an incubation period of seven to 14 days. The first symptom to appear is a high fever, approximately 40 degrees Celsius, which can last for four days to seven days. And that's the prodromal phase. That's marked by malaise, anorexia, and the fever that we just mentioned. This is the classic triad, and also the classic triad. The classic triad is the three C's, conjunctivitis, cough, and coryza, all three of which produce mucus and spread saliva and mucus everywhere. Conjunctivitis is inflammation of the conjunctiva, which is the mucous membranes around your eye. Pink eye is a conjunctivitis. Bacterial pink eye and viral pink eye are different kinds of conjunctivitis. But conjunctivitis is just a symptom. And it causes mucus secretion from the eyes. Cough spreads the mucus into the air. Coryza is runny nose. And that's mucus running out of your nose. And how does the virus spread? Through mucus. So you are extraordinarily infectious at this stage. And the other possible symptoms include photophobia, periorbital edema, and myalgia. Photophobia, fear of light. If your eyes hurt, you don't want to be in bright lights. Periorbital edema, the orbit 
is your eye socket. The area around your eyes, the area around your eye socket, swells up. This can actually cause permanent eye damage, permanent visual damage. And myalgias are muscle pains. So after the prodrome, small spots can be seen inside the mouth. Those small spots are called coplic spots. They are pathognomonic of measles. Pathognomonic, P-A-T-H-O-G-N-O-M-O-N-I-C. Pathognomonic means it is named only by that disease. Measles is the only thing that can ever cause coplic spots. You will never see coplic spots in any other disease. Measles is the only thing that does it. Nothing else causes coplic spots. And this is the inside of a baby, of a child's cheek. These little white spots right here are the coplic spots. And I apologize if the image is grainy. Beggars can't be choosers. Y'all should have been here. All right. So these coplic spots will typically last three to five days. If you see coplic spots, you know it's measles. Remember though, this patient has already been infectious for one to two days before the four to seven days of fever. So they've already been infectious for a minimum of five days and a maximum of nine days. They've already been infectious for five to nine days before the coplic spots even appear. Before that, it was just a fever with some runny nose and mucus everywhere. That could be anything. So one to two days after the coplic spots appear, you'll get a rash. It'll start on the face and the upper neck and then spread over the entire body over the course of seven to 10 days that it will last. So over about three days, the rash will spread to the entire body, and then that rash will last the rest of that time. If you don't see the complex spots, if you see the complex spots, you know it's measles. You're done. But if you, do, if you don't see the complex spots, but you see fever, and then the classic triad, and then you see the rash, you're almost 100% certain that it's measles. You are, it is enough. But if you're not 100% certain, if you didn't catch the fever before, or if, they, or if they only came in after the rash appeared, then there are antibody tests for active measles infection. So these are some of the, uh, these are some uh, images for the symptoms of measles. Complications of measles are unfortunately not rare. And they include severe infections of the upper respiratory tract, the sinuses and the ears, which can lead to permanent damage. Brain damage and seizures can also happen. Permanent sensory deficits like blindness can also happen. And, this cur and measles currently accounts for approximately 10% of annual infant mortality worldwide. In other words, 10% of all the babies that die, of all the infants that die every year, die from measles. One in 10 of every infant that dies in a year dies from measles. There are very few treatments for any viral illness. Viral illnesses do not, generally treat, do not generally have good treatments. There are exceptions, of course, but measles is not one of those exceptions. So the best defense is to not get sick at all. The incidence in 2014 was 462,000 cases. And the mortality in 2014 
was 115,000. That's 314 deaths a day, 13 deaths an hour, a death, give or take, every five minutes, plus or minus. So these are areas where there are reported measles cases in a six-month period. It's everywhere. No reported cases doesn't mean there aren't cases. It just means they're not reported. Measles is everywhere. It's not gone, it's everywhere. But good news, there is a vaccine. So the vaccine was originally introduced in 1963 and it has dramatically reduced the child mortality due to measles since the introduction. So there has been a 79% drop in measles deaths between 2000 and 2014 worldwide. In 2014, about 85% of the world's children received one dose of measles vaccine by their first birthday through routine health services, up from 73% in 2000. So, a 12% increase in vaccination rate in 14 years resulted in a 79% decrease in mortality. No other health care expenditure will ever get you that kind of return on investment. It is the most cost effective buy in public health is the most cost-effective expenditure in public health. It, 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 in those 14 years, it prevented an estimated 17.1 million deaths. Here in the United States in 2015, we had a measles outbreak. There were 92 cases in California. It started in Disney World. Some child who had measles came in from out of the country and there was a population in California there was a population in California that was not receiving the measles vaccine because a child with measles can infect so many people and it is 90% rates of infection for a non-immune susceptible person upon exposure to contract measles. A person who is not immune, a person who is susceptible, will contract measles 90% of the times they are exposed. A group of non-immune children in a place with one transmissible case resulted in 92 infections and because it was Disney those kids got on planes and went home and they went everywhere else so we had a measles outbreak across the country I'll leave it at that so I want to talk now about herd immunity Herd immunity is the concept where if you have a population that has sufficient rates of immunity, the pathogen cannot spread from one individual to another. So we resume with herd immunity or rather, actually just splice it here. Herd immunity is the concept that a group of individuals who is not immune, if a few cases of an infectious disease 
are allowed into a group of susceptible individuals, then one person will spread it to someone else who will spread it to the next person, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next until everyone is infected. Those outliers on the outer edge are safe for whatever reason, either because they are the lucky ones, because they barricaded their homes, because they're homeschooled, because they built a bunker under their house, whatever. For whatever reason, they didn't catch it, but everybody else did. That's no one being immunized. In a situation where a few people are immunized because they wish to stay safe, that's lovely for them, but those individuals will stay safe. But the pathogen does not require them. It can spread to someone else and then it will spread through that population again. Throughout the population and those who are vaccinated, those who are immune because of vaccination, will not get sick. And those same outliers, for whatever reason, because they barricaded their homes, because they are homeschooled, because they are not exposed, because they built a bunker under their house, same crazy folks, did not get sick. The same lucky few. But the ones who were, I don't want to get sick, so I'm going to get the shot. They didn't get sick. Good for them. Didn't help anybody else. Herd immunity occurs when a sufficient number, what is the sufficient number? Depends on the disease. Herd immunity occurs when a sufficient number of individuals are vaccinated and have immunity. The individuals who are ill, the individuals who become infectious, who become infectious with a transmissible illness, cannot transmit that illness to the next person, who can then transmit it to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. In that instance, one person who decided not to get their vaccine got it, but nobody else did. These two, who in both other instances would have would have been susceptible and would have and would have uh, gotten sick and become contagious themselves did not they were protected by everyone else being vaccinated they were protected from these two individuals who were contagious by everyone else being protection they were indirectly immune. They were, they were susceptible, but they were not able to be infected. So that's herd immunity, where there are enough people who, don't, who are not able to transmit the infection, so the people who do not have, so the people who are not immune are not infected because of them, because of the yellow folks. Let's talk about smallpox now. Smallpox was caused by orthopox variola virus. Orthopox, vari orthopox virus variola virus. Now, I say was because we eradicated smallpox. Smallpox is gone. Done. Goodbye. It's eradicated, it was eradicated in December of 1979, according to the case reports. But it was eradic but May 1980 was when the uh, committee finally certified it. So if you're asked on the exam, 1980. 1980. So generally, it takes direct, fairly prolonged face-to-face -face contact to spread smallpox, to transmit smallpox from one person to another. But you can also transmit 
uh, smallpox from direct contact with the infected body fluids or contaminated object like bedding or clothing or blankets. Just saying. Bad things happen. Reparations should probably be made. All right. So there were four types of smallpox. There was variolar major, which comprised 90% of cases. There was flat type, hemorrhagic type, and variolar minor, which are less important. They comprise 10% of cases. But in general, it had a 30% fatality rate. A 30% fatality rate. From the time of first exposure to smallpox, to symptoms, in other words, the incubation period, was 7 to 17 days. It took time. The first symptom of smallpox was fever, malaise, head and body aches, sometimes vomiting. And the people who got smallpox were way too sick. Uh, they were way too sick to carry out their normal tasks. They had to be taken care of. So that was the prodrome phase. That lasted two to four days. Next thing that happened was the rash came out. The first place the rash came out was in the mouth, the tongue and the mouth. The spots developed into sores. The sores would break open and spread a large amount of virus into the mouth and throat. And that's when they were the most contagious. They were just spitting viral particles everywhere. So, by the time the sores in the mouth broke down, that's when the skin rash started. And it started in the face, around the mouth, and then spread to the arms and legs, then to the hands and feet. Um, and it basically spread across the entire body, from the mouth all the way down the entire body in 24 hours. So as the rash appeared, that fever they were suffering from, that really high fever, which is like 40, 41 Celsius, that fever would go away. It would actually start to dip, and they'd feel a little bit better. So that was actually a little bit, what's the word I'm looking for? Contradictory? No. Ironic. Ironic irony. They'd start to feel better as soon as they were getting worse. Um, yeah. So the fever usually fell and they started to feel better as they were getting worse. So the third day of the rash is when the rash sort of changed. It changed from these little red bumps to these raised bumps. And by the fourth day, they were filled with a thick, opaque fluid with a little umbilicated lesion in it. And the umbilicated lesion, it looked like a little belly button. And that was the major distinguishing characteristic of smallpox. So at that point, that's when the fever rose again. So just when you were starting to look ugly, the fever hit you again. It was a one-two punch. Just when you were down, it decides to hit you again, kicking you while you're down. Uh, smallpox was rude. Um, and the fever remains high until scabs start to form. So, but before the scabs form, before the scabs form, the bumps that were umbilicated, the umbilicated bumps with the white opaque fluid, will become pustules. These sharply raised, round, firm, feels kind of like a BD embedded under your skin, lasted about five days. And at this point, you're actually a little less contagious. Another five days or so, they'll crust over, those pustules will crust over and scab. Then, by the end of the second week after the rash appeared in the first place, most of the sores have scabbed over. Then for another six days or so, the scabs are going to fall off. 
Um, that'll leave marks on the skin, scars, really deep pitted scars. Um, and by about the three weeks after the rash's first appearance, they're pretty much all the scabs are gone. When all of the scabs have fallen off, you're no longer contagious. The infection is gone. Smallpox is over. You survived. If you are one of the not 30% who succumbed, congratulations. But you are left scarred for life, disfiguring scars. And these, these uh, lesions were everywhere. Everywhere you have skin. Everywhere you have skin, there were lesions. So your eyelids, your ears, your butt, your butt crack. People would lose their sight to smallpox because their eyes swelled shut. And then the scar tissue caused them to not be able to open their eyes again. Like, we're talking real bad disfigurement here. Like that. Aren't you glad we got rid of it? So, the disease was disfiguring, it was painful, but it wasn't really until very recently, in fact, like 2009 is one of the papers, I, is the paper I found, that we actually figured out how it really killed people. Um, smallpox actually suppressed the immune system. That's actually how it killed people. Smallpox didn't kill directly. It killed by immune suppression. Yay. Uh, I'm not sure if that's tested by Cambridge, but it is nice to know. So, in terms of the uh, how to test for smallpox, the CDC developed a number of lab protocols in the event of smallpox's return, um, in case it comes back, uh, or if it's used as a bioterrorism agent, which um, I really sincerely hope that it is not, because that would be horrifying. Um, these tests really are moot. It doesn't matter. We, we don't need them because there is no smallpox in the population anymore. No one has smallpox. The only smallpox that exists is in a lab freezer in various places around the globe. Yeah. Uh, but in the post-eradication era, chickenpox was often confused for smallpox because you got a full body rash with vesicles that were opaque. But unlike smallpox, chickenpox usually didn't affect the palms and the soles of the feet. Smallpox did. So also in chickenpox, the vesicles, the pustules, were of varying size. Because smallpox, you would have one area, uh, sorry, smallpox, everything would be uniform. All of these lesions would be the same stage of lesion. You might have one area that was scabbed over and the next that was a pustule, maybe, but they were pretty close. But with chicken pox, you might have a new area of rash forming over here and right next to it, a scab. Like brand new redness over here and a scab over on the other part of the arm or somewhere over here, a full-on vesicle, and clear skin over here, or a pockmarked scar on the elbow. So you'll have different stages all over the place in chicken, mo in chicken pox. But if you're unsure, if you were ever unsure, there were laboratory, ex there were laboratory tests to test for small, uh, there were tests for chicken pox. There are laboratory tests to check for chicken pox antigens antibodies and antigens. So, this is Edward Jenner. In 1798, smallpox was killing hundreds of thousands of people every year, until Edward Jenner noticed that milkmaids who had contracted cowpox, a less deadly form of the disease, didn't get smallpox. This was the first vaccine. I strongly urge you, and this is a shameless plug for one of my favorite channels, uh, SciShow. Uh, please, go to SciShow, and uh, if I remember, I'll put a link in the description myself. Um, but yeah, please, go to SciShow, because this is the only time that he'll look like a hero to you. He's a monster. He cut up children. 
um, and infect and rubbed pus into their wounds. That was his vaccine. Yeah, his version of the vaccine was to rub pus into an open wound. Yeah, without his parent, without the parents' permission too. All right. So, anyway, smallpox continued. Um, the only way to prevent smallpox was and is the smallpox vaccine. The vaccine itself was made from the vaccinia virus, a live virus, a cousin of smallpox, a cousin of variola virus. It does not cause smallpox. It doesn't even cause cowpox. It causes no symptoms whatsoever. It is completely harmless. But it shares the same surface antigens as smallpox, as variola virus. And because of that, exposure to vaccinia gives you immunity through adaptive specific immunity, which we will discuss in great detail later, gives you immunity to smallpox. And it is a very effective vaccine, fantastically effective. And routine vaccination in the American public ended in 1972, but continued through the rest of the world until 1979, 1980, and a little bit after that, just because we officially eradicated in 1980. So, until recently, the U.S. government provided the smallpox vaccine only to a few hundred scientists and medical professionals who worked with the smallpox and similar viruses in a research setting, but um, that's not necessarily not, that's not necessary anymore. But after September and October of 2011, uh, the U.S. government had to change its uh, level of preparedness in the event of a smallpox used as a bioterrorism agent, which I sincerely hope it never is, because that would be, as I said before, truly horrible. Just awful. And you've seen the picture of that kid's face. I mean, really. Really. That's awful. But anyway, the vaccine is not available to the public at this time. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not. You, you don't need it, because no one has smallpox. Smallpox is eradicated. No one has smallpox now. All right, let's talk about HIV and AIDS. HIV is an acronym for the Human Immunodeficiency Virus. The infection that results from that virus in targets the CD4 T cells the helper T cells. When CD4 T cells drop below a certain level, the host is susceptible to a number of opportunistic infections, and that's typically the cause of death. People who get HIV who don't receive treatment, they will typically progress through three stages of disease. There is a medication, there are medications that are known to treat HIV. These are antiretroviral therapies, ART. The typical treatment is called highly active antiretroviral therapy, HART. You do call it HART. You don't call it ART. This helps people at all stages of the disease if you take it right away every day. If you lapse, the virus can mutate and the treatment can be no longer effective. So it can slow the progression of disease from one stage to the next, and it can actually dramatically improve the symptoms, um, and it can actually dramatically improve uh, your, uh, reduce your risk of dying from opportunistic infections. And it can also reduce the risk of transmitting HIV to someone else who is HIV negative. So here are the stages of HIV infection. There is the acute HIV infection. Within two to four weeks after infection with HIV, that is the incubation period, a person may experience flu-like symptoms. The prodromal phase of HIV 
is a flu that lasts for a few weeks. You'll feel like a flu for a couple weeks. Not a bad flu. You just feel like crap. This is the body's natural response to an infection. This is the immune response at work. So at that point, you will have circulating antibodies to HIV and the indirect ELISA will be positive. They have a large amount of virus in their blood in this stage and they are very contagious. But there are only a few ways to transmit HIV, so we'll talk about those. People with an acute infection are often unaware that they are infected because they may not feel right, sick right away or even at all. To know whether someone has an acute infection, a fourth generation antibody test or an, an, uh, or an antigen test, the indirect or direct ELISA, or a nucleic acid test is necessary. Stage two, clinical latency. This period is sometimes called asymptomatic HIV or chronic HIV. HIV is still active. HIV is still active, but is being reproduced, it is reproducing at a very low level. You may not show symptoms at this stage or get sick at all. If you're not taking medication for, if you're not taking highly active antiretroviral therapy, heart, this period can last a decade or longer, but some may progress through this phase faster, a couple of years. People who are taking medication to treat HIV, highly atrophic heart, the right way, every day, may be in this stage for several decades. Magic Johnson being a prime example. People can still transmit HIV to others at this stage. You, just because you have low viral load, just because you have less virus in your bloodstream, does not mean you are not infectious. It just means that you are less likely to transmit. So, heart therapy, or heart period, highly, highly active antiretroviral therapy, can suppress the viral load, making you even less likely to transmit the virus. Low viral load means low infectivity. High viral load means high infectivity. Highly infectious, less infectious. Still infectious, key, still infectious. Every stage, still infectious. At the end of this phase, a person's viral load will start to go up and the CD4 count will go down. And this is the beginning of stage three. Stage three is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS. AIDS is the most severe phase. A badly damaged immune system results in a number of severe illnesses called opportunistic infection. People with AIDS typically survive three years without treatment, without proper treatment. Common symptoms will include chills, fever, sweats, swollen lymph glands, weakness, weight loss. People diagnosed with AIDS when their CD4 count drops below 200 cells per, micro, per cubic millimeter, or if they develop certain opportunistic infections. You do not need the white cell count, you do not need the T cell count if you have the opportunistic infections. An opportunistic infection defines AIDS. The white cell count the T cell count rather, the helper T cell count, defines AIDS. So it's either a number or an opportunistic infection defining AIDS. So you can have a high viral load and be very infectious at this stage too. These are the opportunistic infections. There's 20 of them. So either you're below 200 cells or you have one of these. Candidiasis, oral thrush, is candidiasis. 
but it's candidiasis of the bronchi, trachea, esophagus, or lungs. It is candidiasis in places where it's not just the back of the mouth. It's spread out. Invasive cervical cancer indicates that HPV is running rampant. A vaccine preventable illness, by the way. Coccidiomycosis, cryptococcus, cryptosporidiosis. Those are all those are all uh, fungal infections. CMV, particularly CMV retinitis, that's a viral infection. HIV-related encephalopathy, herpes simplex chronic ulcers of the mouth. If you have herpes of the mouth that lasts for more than a month that hasn't cleared up, bam. Or if the herpes simplex progresses to herpes bronchitis or herpes pneumonia, or herpes esophagitis, yeah, that can happen too. Histoplasmosis is also a fungus, I believe. Yes, yes, it's also a fungus. Kaposi's sarcoma is a, a cancer of the blood vessels under the skin, purple splotches, caused by HHV8, herpes, human herpes virus 8. Lymph, multiple forms of lymphoma, MAC, Mycobacterium avian complex. Tuberculosis, which we will discuss later. Converting from latent to active is an AIDS-defining illness. PCP pneumonia, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. Recurrent pneumonia. Progressive multifocal leukose encephalopathy is a PML. That is That is um, similar to AIDS and to HIV encephalopathy. I need to relook that one up, actually. Salmonella septicemia, recurrent. Toxoplasmosis you get from feral cat poop. If your cat, if your pet cat is an outdoor cat, you're not cleaning the litter box anymore. Never. Uh huh. Never touch the poop. Toxoplasmosis is a, pla is a uh, parasite in the cat poop. In fact, <laughs> it's killing the kangaroos and stuff at the zoo now. They're dying of toxoplasmosis. Apparently, I read an article. Um, anyway, wasting syndrome due to HIV. Yeah. Only certain body fluids can transmit HIV. You can only transmit HIV through certain body fluids. Blood, semen, preseminal fluid, rectal fluids, vaginal fluids, and breast milk. You cannot transmit HIV through saliva. You can kiss people with HIV and not contract HIV. Unless, of course, they're bleeding into their mouth. In which case, don't, please don't kiss them because that, that presents a whole host of other issues. Don't kiss someone who's bleeding from the gums because, ow, ouch. That would probably hurt them. Uh, don't. Right. So the fluids that contain viral particles must come in contact with damaged tissue or even intact mucous membrane in order to enter the bloodstream for transmission to occur. The most common form of transmission is through sexual behavior or needle and syringe use. In the United States, it is primarily spread through unprotected sexual intercourse with an HIV positive individual. Anal sex has the highest risk behavior. Vaginal sex is also a high risk behavior. It is the second highest risk behavior. And sharing needles, especially for IV drug users. And the video is about to cut out. Continuing on, less commonly, um, HIV can be spread from mother to child during pregnancy, birth, or during breastfeeding. However, if the mother is taking highly active antiretroviral therapy, you reduce the risk of vertical transmission. 
That is when you, vertical transmission is transmission from mother to child, from parent to offspring. That is vertical transmission. There is also a less common cause of transmission, and that is being stuck by an HIV contaminated needle. Primarily, healthcare workers are at risk for this while treating HIV positive patients. In extremely rare cases, HIV has been transmitted by oral sex, but only when the body fluids that carry HIV particles are deposited on a mucous membrane. So, also rare cases these days, not in the early days, but in these days, blood transfusion, blood products, and organ and tissue transplants of, with, donors, tra, uh, with donors who were infected with HIV. This was common in the early years, but now it's very rare because we test everything. If you've been, uh, in some rare cases, babies have been infected with uh, HIV by pre-chewing the food and depositing it in their mouths. Because, I don't know, that's, that, that's a weird, that's an odd habit and it's, it's gaining popularity these days. I'm not sure why, um, not 100% sure why, uh, but it's a thing, um, but usually infants, only known cases are among infants. Um, if you are bitten by a person with HIV, unless they are bleeding and they break skin, if they break your skin and they bleed into your wound while biting you, that's how HIV is transmitted. So remember, saliva does not transmit HIV. The bite is more likely to cause an infection because of the bacteria in that person's mouth than it is to give you HIV. However, if you were punching them in the face and they were bleeding and then they bit you, then yeah, their blood got into your open bite wound. And yeah, that's a problem, but it's very rare. And you shouldn't be fighting someone like that anyway. That's, that's violent, and I don't encourage violence. Um, right, so if you have any contact between broken skin or a wound or a mucous membrane and any fluid that is HIV positive, so if there's blood sitting on the ground, don't touch it. Don't touch the blood on the ground. Um, and if someone is bleeding from their gums, don't kiss them. Please, don't kiss someone who's bleeding from their gums because, ouch, it would hurt. Please. All right. So, we've learned since the early days that um, HIV actually arose in Africa from a simian immunodeficiency virus. It jumped from chimpanzees to humans, not, as the rumor says, from intercourse with the chimpanzees, but from uh, eating the chimpanzees, hunting them for meat, and then preparing them, you know, carving them and, you know, and using and, and messing with the bloody parts before cooking. Because, you know, when you cut up animals, they tend to bleed. Yeah. That's how that happened. So sometime back in the 1800s was probably when that jump occurred. And over the decades, it slowly spread across Africa. And we know that the virus has existed in the United States at least since the mid to late 70s, in the 1970s. But it wasn't until the 80s that the epi 